Do you realize that in the 1800s, pretty much everybody except the ivory tower theologians and so-called scholars trusted just one Bible in English? It's like the joke about when Eve looked over at Adam and said, Adam, do you love me? Adam looked back at her and said, who else? There was no other Bible to run to. People had the big black book. That was it. It was God's words in English, and there was no debating it. Can you imagine that? It was the norm. So how did we get from everyone having just one Bible to the place where you will be ridiculed left and right and even kicked out of your church if you believe in that exact same King James Bible your great-great-grandparents did? How did we get to this point? You want to see some amazing coincidences? Hi, I'm David Daniels from Chick Publications. If you have a modern Bible, you have missing or changed words, phrases, and verses compared to the King James Bible, or else your Bible likely has footnotes claiming that the best manuscripts don't have those words. That's mainly because of one Greek text, the Codex Sinaiticus, which supposedly shows the oldest available readings of what should be in the Bible. As many of you know, in the beginning of December 2015, I started researching the Sinaiticus and began a vlog series about Sinaiticus. I thought it was just going to be a couple of videos, tops, what more could there be? But seven months later, I had learned a whole mess of things I thought were unbelievable before. But some of you didn't watch the 30-something videos, so I want to catch you up. For the rest of you, this will be a refresher before I tell you more. In April 1944, an occultist who hobnobbed with world leaders, Manly P. Hall, admitted to his followers that, as he put it, we have been trying to put out a Bible for the last 100 years that was reasonably correct, according to this occultist. The purpose, he admitted, was to get people away from believing every jot and tittle of the King James Version. Why only get people away from believing the King James? But then that set me to thinking, 100 years before Hall's admission was 1844. And the only Bible-related major event of 1844 was Tischendorf's discovery of the supposedly oldest and best Greek Codex Sinaiticus in a desert monastery in the Egyptian peninsula. So, was there something funny about Sinaiticus? I had thought the Sinaiticus was an old perversion of the scriptures, but didn't seriously consider that it could have been a modern fake, made to get people away from the King James, like Manly P. Hall wanted. I had a number of questions that had to be answered first. Let me pick some important ones. The testimony about the Sinaiticus being a modern document hinges on three people and two places. One, there was a Greek calligrapher copyist accused of being a forger named Constantine Simonides. Two, there supposedly was a monk named Kalanikos. He was the guy who spilled the beans and backed Simonides' story of creating the Sinaiticus. He called Tischendorf a liar and a thief. Kalanikos had actually seen Tischendorf aging the Sinaiticus with lemon juice. Three, there was supposedly another monk named Benedict. He was the head guy at a monastery, said to be on Mount Athos in Greece. He asked his nephew Simonides to create the Sinaiticus as a gift to Tsar Nicholas I of Russia to get him to pay for a printing press for Benedict's monastery since the Tsar was the guy who financially supported the monastery. That monastery was on Mount Athos and was called Pantelemon. 
and five, that monastery was supposed to be connected to another monastery in the Egyptian peninsula called St. Catherine's. It's next to what the Catholics claim is Mount Sinai. You know, that's the place where Tischendorf claimed he discovered the Sinaiticus. So, a whole string of people, places, and events had to be factual before we could even consider the idea that Sinaiticus is not ancient, but actually a modern fake. This isn't as hard as it looks, if we take it apart one piece at a time. Are you ready to take it apart with me? Way back in 1863, a literary journal in England debated all the details of this different story about the origin of the Sinaiticus. As I look at this again today, they raised some really good questions. You can download copies of the issues of this journal from the Internet Archive yourself. It's the JSL, the Journal of Sacred Literature, from April 1863, starting on page 210. In it are some very good points. I'll go over them with you. Was there a Kalanikos? On page 211 of the JSL, the editor wrote first, the evidence of the writer of the letter is simply worthless until we know who the writer himself is. That's totally fair. Is Kalanikos a real guy? Or did Simonides make him up somehow? The editor wrote second that Kalanikos' letter is a very suspicious echo of Simonides' own statements. So if Simonides says, I made the Sinaiticus, and Kalanikos says Simonides made the Sinaiticus, and their whole testimony is identical, then that would be suspicious. The editor wrote third, we do not recognize the name of the monastery at Athos, Pantalemon. You, you mean, mean this? Or this? <laughs> or this? That's funny because it's been on Mount Athos since the 11th century. When so-called experts poo-poo something, it doesn't mean they have really researched the facts. Sometimes they just say it because it's what they heard from someone else, and they hope you will believe them without checking any further. Just because somebody says something doesn't exist doesn't mean it isn't there. And just because we don't have the answer right now doesn't mean there isn't one. So here are some other facts I found out when I did check. One, Kalanikos is a real guy. As I showed you in the Sinaiticus series, Kalanikos was documented by historian Spiridon Palolampros in his 1900 catalog of the Greek manuscripts on Mount Athos as being on Mount Athos in the Pantelimon Monastery on March 27, 1841. And Kalanikos was working on a project with Constantine Simonides. Ah, so the guy did exist. For that matter, Benedict was a real guy too. Take a look at all these places in Lampros's 1900 catalog that show Benedict's name. Two, Kalanikos' testimony is not exactly identical with Simonides. There are some differences which real testimonies have. However, I have been able to reconcile them. But three, Kalanikos clearly knew way back then specific facts about the Sinaiticus that I only found out in the last few years using modern research tools. First, the Sinaiticus was darkened sometime between 1851 and 1859. Kalanikos was the only other guy to note that, even major scholars for over 150 years missed that. On page 214 of the journal, it records Simonides' claim that the Sinaiticus was altered, 
which he saw when he visited St. Catherine. Simonides said, quote, I examined the manuscript and found it much altered, having a much having an older appearance than it ought to have. Then Simonides added the dedication to the emperor Nicholas, placed at the beginning of the book, had been removed. Kalanikos' words were also very specific on this. On page 212 of the JSL, it quotes Kalanikos' letter saying, And I know yet further that the codex was cleaned with lemon juice. Professedly, for the purpose of cleaning its parchments, but in reality, in order to weaken the freshness of the letters, as was actually the case. In other words, to make it look older. Second, Tischendorf stole the Sinaiticus. As the editor stated in the same article, the letter of Kalanikos charges Tischendorf with theft. And Tischendorf did steal parts of the Sinaiticus. That's just history. I went over this carefully in the Something Funny About Sinaiticus vlog playlist. You are welcome to see the overwhelming evidence yourself. So far, Kalanikos is batting a thousand. Then, the 1863 JSL editor nailed it. He rightly pointed out that we should be taking into consideration the remarkable coincidence between the letter of Kalanikos and the story it is intended to corroborate. The extreme improbability of his having been on the spot at such critical moments in the history of the manuscript. He's right. There's a lot you can read for yourself in Kalanikos' testimony, but I'll summarize. In 1841, on March 27th, Kalanikos was on Mount Athos in Pantelemon Monastery with Simonides working on an Easter poem by John of Damascus. Two years later, in February of 1843, Kalanikos was on Mount Athos in Pantelemon Monastery and described Simonides working on the Sinaiticus. After that, the patriarch Constantius sent the Sinaiticus to St. Catherine's to have another monk, Callistratus, compare it with other documents, then send it to Simonides for final copying. Then it was supposed to be sent to the Tsar Nicholas I of Russia. But Simonides was busy and didn't get down to St. Catherine's. If you watch the smoking gun video, you know where Simonides was. He was across the Aegean Sea in Smyrna, Turkey, comparing the same epistle of Barnabas that he had written in the Sinaiticus with seven other Greek editions of Barnabas that were to be found on Mount Athos. Simonides was validating the text that he was putting into the Sinaiticus before it got sent to the Tsar. Simonides didn't forget about Sinaiticus in 1843. He was busy validating its Greek epistle of Barnabas. He wrote a whole book about it and published that in Smyrna, Turkey. Then Kalanikos showed up traveling with a patriarch Constantius to St. Catherine's without Simonides in 1843, bringing the Sinaiticus. He went again the next year in 1844 when Tischendorf came to St. Catherine's and discovered the Sinaiticus. He might also have been there in 1853 when Tischendorf returned, and he was there in 1859 when Tischendorf brought the Russian delegation to grab Sinaiticus. Here from page 212 of the JSL are Kalanikos' own words. And last of all, coming again to the same monastery, he, Tischendorf, obtained also the remaining portion of it through the Russian consul in exchange for hyperbolical promises never, in my judgment, likely to be fulfilled. Those were Tischendorf's promises to return the Sinaiticus, which Kalanikos is right, he didn't. Kalanikos continues, All these things I know, having been 
on the spot. And I declare them now openly for the sake of the truth. So we cannot believe the experts when they say things are true or false, can we? No. We have to check for ourselves. Because look at what we learned from all this other evidence, from these independent sources. Simonides was a real Greek text scholar. Kalanikos was a real monk. They worked together. Benedict was a real head monk. He's Simonides' uncle. Pantelaimon is a real monastery on Mount Athos. It's been there since the 1000s AD. Rusico Pantelaimon. Oh, by the way, Pantelaimon's other name is Rusico, the only Russian monastery on Mount Athos. Rusico, Pantelaimon, and St. Catherine's were both under the Russian Tsar. And Kalanikos recorded facts almost no one in the world either noticed or witnessed. He was clearly there in all those places, at all those times. They all really verifiably happened. They are remarkable coincidences. Or maybe they're not coincidences. Maybe there's a bigger mind that planned for this to happen. But I'll get more into that in the next video. God bless you and have a wonderful day.